Well, uh, you think that this is going to be uh, an exciting talk, and uh, I'm sure it will be. Uh, it is without any safety net, so anything can happen, and uh, it will be exciting from many points of view from that point. So um, let me uh, start with uh, um, showing you uh, an example. Um, you know that um, describing um, sound is almost an impossible task. You could say that it is bright or it is dark or it is dull or it is smooth. Yeah. And uh, how could you... Well, you know that people who listen to your description don't get what you mean because uh, sound is what you hear and what not what you can't describe. However, uh, visual perception is much more precise and dominant than auditory perception. So looking at sound as you hear them is sometimes a great help. And I will show you some examples of this. this. Um, uh, so let me s go to the first uh, exciting uh, adventure here and see if... Um, uh, if we could look at uh, some things at the same time, namely listen to uh, um, a voice and uh, seeing how it is um, uh, running at the same time. Uh, I take the Wave Surfer program free on the internet and then uh, I ask uh, uh, a voice to start Speaking. Du gamla, du fria, du fjällhöga nord, <laughs> du tysta, du glädjerika sköna. Jag hälsar dig värnaste land upp på jord, din sol, din himmel, dina ängder gröna. Din sol, din himmel, dina ängder gröna. And du gamla, du fria, du fjällhöga nord, du tysta, du glädjerika sköna. Jag hälsar dig, värnaste land på jord. Din sol, din himmel, dina ängder gröna. Din sol, din himmel, dina ängder gröna. Ja, Eller... Ja, tystna tagen. Du, 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 du härsjö, härsjö, du, du gamla, du, 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 du fria, du, du, du fjällhöga nordsjö. Du, du, du tysta, du glädjerika, sköna här. Och jag, 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 jag hälsar dig, värnaste land uppe på jord. Din sol, din jävla himmel och dina ängder gröna. Din sol, din himmel och dina ängder gröna. Ja, det var det var tre voices um, and they were all oddly enough produced by one single uh, impersonator, uh, namely um, uh, Anders. Mortensson impersonator. Um, he um, was... <clears throat> I'm interested in how you could bend your voice in order to uh, get different personalities. And he was an excellent subject for that. Okay. Now, let me talk a bit about speech production. Um, and uh, let us see speech production... Um, uh, with um, X-ray technique, the magnetic resonance. Um, this is myself. En pojke kom en dag inspringande på en bondgård och undrade om han kunde få låna en spade. När bonden frågade hur djupt han hade ramlat i, svarade pojken att hans bror hade ramlat i ett träsk och att han måste kräva upp honom. Hur djupt har han ramlat i, frågade bonden. Upp till britterna blev svaret. Ja, men då kan han väl gå därifrån utan din hjälp. Då behöver du väl ingen spade. Pojken så förtvivlad ut och sa, jo men det förstår han ramlade i med huvudet först. So when I look at this, I'm amazed at what virtuosity we have without knowing anything about it to control all the um, parts and uh, tools of the human voice in order to get the message across. Um, uh, that is fascinating. Um, now let's see uh, what uh, some voice properties, how they could be visualized. Uh, so this one should be listening to uh, what the microphone hears and uh, I could give you some 
examples of speech sounds, and <laughs> you could see how they look. could see that the spectrum contour changes whatever you say and our ears detect these changes and interpret them as meaningful messages. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> <clears throat> So um, we ha see then a spectrum is uh, uh, sound level on the vertical axis and, and frequency on the horizontal axis. And why do lo vowel spectra look like that? Well, the instrument is um, consisting of a, a bellow system, the, the respiratory system, and a vibratory system, the vocal folds, and then a resonatory system, the vocal tract, and they cooperate to make this uh, thing. And now let's see what the vocal folds are doing. I think I have a um, um, high-speed uh, um, image or a, a movie. This is uh, um, the uh, uh, vocal f uh, apparatus, the vibratory part of it. And here we have one vocal fold, and here we have another vocal fold. This is there are two <coughs> cartilages that hold the the back of the vocal folds, and they could lean backwards or they could lean forwards so to stretch the folds or to slacken them, and they could open the glottis, the slit between the folds, and, and close it. And this is ve happening very quickly. Okay, uh, this is the epiglottis, and uh, as um, the tone onset um, con uh, continues, you will see that the it, it disappears from the, from the uh, mi image, so that the Epiglottis is now uh, hiding part of the uh, vocal folds, but it will rise like that, so we could see it more freely. Uh, so uh, this is how it looks, and it gives you, uh, this is a tone onset, the vocal fold starts to vibrate there, and uh, finally they reach contact. You could s sense the quality of the folds, they are very sl sloppy um, structures, and you could see wakes, svalvågor, uh, on the surface of the, of the um, vocal fold as, you, uh, as, uh, as a response to the collisions. Um, <coughs> this is run at about 2,000 images per second. Okay, so that is the vocal fold vibration. Uh, and let me now move on a bit um, um, uh, and uh, talk about what happens here in the vibratory part. Um, the glottis is the, uh, is the slit between the vocal folds and um, uh, maybe you want to make friend with your glottis. I invite you to that experience. You close and open your glottis when you do like this. <coughs> that is closing and opening the glottis. And you could also experience that you could close the glottis very firmly, <coughs> like this, and uh, very loosely, and <sighs> like that. So uh, there is a lot of variability there, apart from... from um, uh, f f f f from the vibration. Okay, so this is the, the, the a reason why the vocal folds um, run into vibration. That is because the structures force the layers at the side to uh, to run a longer pathway 
than the central layer of their airstream. And that means that there will be greater distance between the air particles in this um, line of um, air particles that have to um, bend around the obstacle of the vocal fold. It is the same like um, you could get between the between your four two fingers. So what happens when th this is the, the um, snapshot series of the vibrations so that you see that the vocal folds uh, left and right and then um, uh, the air pressure in the lungs um, throws them apart from the b lower part first and then to <coughs> along the entire thickness of the glottis and then um, because of the aerodynamic forces and elastic forces, the lower part are getting together and they eventually kiss and then the kiss is um, uh, propagating upper to upper um, uh, to co com to uh, to complete the glottal closure. So that is just one one um, cycle of um, vocal fold vibration. <laughs> Um, but anyway, the, the folds alternately uh, open and close the glottis. And <coughs> the air below the glottis is compressed because when we phonate, we have high pressure, we have compressed air in the lungs. So that means that uh, the vocal folds create a uh, pulsating glottal air stream. <coughs> Uh, and uh, the uh, airstream could be uh, illustrated like this. Uh, we have glottal airflow here in something like liters or milliliter per second versus time. And as long as the glottis is closed, there will be no uh, air, no liter coming through. And when they separate, uh, an air flow is starting and then it is interrupted by the closing of the glottis again. And then the next air pulse is on its way uh, after a little while. And uh, if you sing at 440 hertz fundamental frequency, you will produce 440 such pulses per second. And uh, the queen of the night is uh, in a great hurry that then you need to produce 1700 per second. And a low bass goes down to about 65 or so. So that's a very flexible system. The pulsating glottal airflow is sound, as you heard when I blew my fingers. And if I could take my head off and demonstrate my uh, sound, glottal sound, it would sound like this. Yeah, so this is my voice without the head. Uh, and I took it uh, without asking the ethical committee, I uh, took it uh, away with uh, filtering. Uh, but it is interesting that uh, this is the sound of all, that is the raw material of all voiced sound, consonants and vowels. And the, <coughs> the identity that is added uh, in the resonator, resonator. But anyway, you could do uh, things um, uh, with, with the, the glottal airflow. First of all, it consists of a chord of simultaneous s s uh, sign tones. And uh, the sound of it is, uh, as you heard, and um, it is built up by a um, fascinating set of partials. So uh, this signal contains, is a chord of simultaneously sounding partials, and uh, um, y y you could, you could um, uh, show its spectrum. If you show its spectrum, it looks like this with the uh, um, first and second and third and so on, uh, partial. They are all harmonic, so if you have 110 hertz here, you have two times 110 there and three times 110 there and so on. A boring system. <coughs> okay, this is a spectrum of a real vowel uh, with the uh, peaks and values that you saw when I demonstrated it 
on the s s spectrum uh, analyzer. And uh, it is then containing uh, one partial that is called the fundamental that we perceive as the pitch. And then we have a sec uh, overtones also, and all the fundamental plus the overtones are called partials. Um, uh, the uh, fundamental uh, is the lowest one, as I said, and then the second one is f uh, appearing one octave higher, and then uh, between the second and third there is a fifth, and then there is a fourth, and then there is a major third, and then there is a little less major third and then uh, uh, eventually comes the septima and then um, they come more and more densely packed. But this is a fantastic uh, coincidence. Um, the reason why we have music is, uh, I would say, the fact that we have musical intervals between the lower partials in the harmonic spectrum. And harmonic spectra is produced by almost all um, music instruments, organs and strings and, and guitars uh, and even piano, but, but, uh, but not um, percussion instruments. Anyway, um, that is the uh, build-up of the spectrum of a vowel. Um, we could uh, make a little experiment here and ask uh, the synthesizer uh, Madde uh, and um, ask him to show what he is doing uh, on the um, on the spectrum analyzer. Uh, so uh, I will ask Madde to uh, produce a sound and we could look at the sound in the s in same time. Yes, here we see it, um, and uh, uh, it is a rather high pitch, yeah, so, yeah, okay, uh, this is not a very convincing synthesis of a vowel. I w admit that, because there are, uh, the reason is that there are no resonances. This is the raw material, that is uh, the, the, the voice without the head. So uh, let me add the formants, uh, and uh, um, here is the first, and uh, and we could have a little more. And you could also uh, listen to the build-up uh, of the chord that constitutes the vowel. I will take away all the partials here uh, and uh, um, then there won't be much sound. <laughs> Nay, uh, but I could, uh, I could let the fundamental uh, enter the stage. Okay, and uh, here is the second partial. No vowel, it is just um, sign third. So you could see and <coughs> watch the build-up of, of, of a sound. <coughs> um, the uh, glottal airflow can be varied in important uh, ways. And uh, uh, I think I could demonstrate that by bringing up another possibility here, the easy scope. Uh, I brought a um, black box, and the black box is good because you could wash out the uh, resonances of the vocal tract um, from your uh, production. So um, uh, we could see if I could get this running. Yeah, da, yes, um, I put the yellow line to zero flow, and then uh, if I breathe here, so it, it senses air flow. Hmm? And then you could see, uh, I could show you 
my voice source. Uh, uh, and we could have it a bit more peaceful by putting the trigger here. Uh, yeah. So you see uh, the pulse that uh, reflects the opening of the glottis and then the flat portion that is closed glottis, the closed face. Okay, but I said I, I could vary the uh, voice source, uh, the glottal flow in different ways. Obviously in frequency. Uh, apart from, from uh, pitch I could also vary vocal loudness, and that is a huge effect on the voice. Uh, so let me do that. So you see that the uh, trailing end of the pulses uh, increase in steepness as vocal loudness is increased. And this is created by raising the lung pressure, the air pressure in the lungs, the subglottal pressure. That is the tool for varying vocal loudness. Uh, so that is one. There is a small wiggles in the closed face, and they are artifacts, so you shouldn't see them. It, it is, uh, if you could do it more accurately with more filters, it, they go away. Okay, so that is one possibility. And another one is um, glottal adduction, how firmly you squeeze the glottis. If I don't squeeze this at all, I get this wise. <sighs> where I lose a lot of air. I mean, uh, along the vertical axis here, you have liter per second. So I when the curve goes high, I spend a lot of liter per second. And when the curve goes uh, with small pulses like this, uh, I save airflow. I don't spend very much air in that. But it doesn't sound very convincing. But that's an aesthetical point of view. Okay. Uh, uh, there is uh, a leaky breathy phonation, leaky phonation, and there is then pressed phonation that ah, this ah, and then there is neutral phonation like speaking, uh, something like that. And in between breathy and speaking neutral phonation, you have what I have been calling flow phonation that sounds like this rather than like this. Uh, uh, I have a bit uh, rather than uh, uh. so you see that the pulses are huge in flow phonation and they are much smaller in <coughs> in neutral phonation and both these types of phonation have a clear closed face, so there is no waste of, of air in the process. Um, if you have big air pulses, uh, then you get a lot of airflow, of course. Um, and if the pulses are small, there is not very much of airflow. Now let me show um, a very low technology tool for um, again, bringing the attention of a voice patient or um, a singing student uh, on the um, parameter of airflow. Here is a, um, a tubing and it ends here with a little hole. Uh, so I could blow there. And I could put a little uh, light ball there and blow. So uh, that is showing my airflow. So w now uh, I said that when I use pressed uh, voice, I have very small airflow. And uh, when I have flow phonation, I have big airflow. 
So this is a very simple and actually very cheap. It is three euros or something that you could spend in order. The idea of using it in voice uh, uh, teaching and in voice is, um, 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 was uh, presented by a colleague of mine in Portugal, Philippe Alla. Uh, so that is then um, the variability that you could use um, for expressive purposes or beyond your um, deliberate control for varying your message. <coughs> you have three parameters. You have glottal adduction, which s brings the voice from flow from brethyphonation to prestphonation. You have pitch and you have vocal loudness. <coughs> That's it. So back again to law and order. Uh, we um, uh, go back here. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, this is a schematic, um, uh, more um, or organized and, and clean uh, illustration of the pressed phonation with small pulses, neutral phonation with bigger pulses and a clear closed face, flow phonation with much higher p um, pulses and then uh, breathy phonation where the airflow never touches the zero line because there is a constant leakage. Yeah. <coughs> now let me turn to uh, resonance and um, see what, what happens um, uh, when the input and the reflected sound cooperate. Uh, the, uh, that is uh, happening in very many systems. For instance, uh, um, uh, you could, uh, you could um, imagine that if you... Uh, you must imagine a long tube. This won't work. We have a 100 meter long tube and hit it in one end. And then after a little while, the, uh, the hit sound will return. Okay, it echo. Mm -hmm. And uh, then if you then a new hit the sound exactly at the time when the reflected sound appears, then you have a cooperation between reflected and input sound, and that is resonance. That is resonance. And where does the resonance occur then? Well, if the tube is long, I have to wait for a long time because the back and forth travel is taking a lot of time, so I have to clap rather slowly. And if the tube is short, <coughs> uh, um, I will be mo uh, the, the resonance frequency will be. Um, uh, shorter, and this is the reason why organ prospects look like that with the ba big bass pipes and uh, small uh, treble pipes. But you could also imagine that if you have a tube uh, that has a resonance like this, so you get um, you get c a synchrony between the returning pulses and the input pulses with this kind of frequency. But you could Im easily imagine that, uh, that, that the, the phenomenon of uh, synchrony between reflected and uh, input sound can uh, occur also at higher frequency. Twice as high, for instance, uh, you could still have uh, the synchrony between the returning p pulses and the, and the input pulses, or three times or four times. For, and for that reason, <coughs> in all resonators, tube resonators, there are a number of resonances, not only the lowest resonance. That is the resonance. And it occurs when input and reflected sound cooperate. So if you try <coughs> to send a sine wave, a simple tone, um, <coughs> through a um, resonator like this, uh, then uh, you will find that the sound will be s loud at some frequencies and soft in, in the frequencies in between. And if we are in great luck, um, we could make a demonstration of that uh, together with another software that is freely available on the internet and it is called Tombstone uh, for reasons uh, uh, of history. Tombstone <coughs> is, um, um, uh, you have frequency here and you have amplitude there and uh, uh, I could put a little 
earphone in uh, in the um, um, end end of a, a, um, a plate, and uh, then uh, let um, gliding air um, a gliding tone travel through the tube. So I will try to send different frequencies through the tube and then we all have the right to expect that uh, the sound will be loud at some frequencies and soft at other frequencies. So let's see if it works. Maybe it does. Yeah, so that actually worked. <coughs> um, and you could see that there is a resonance here, and you could measure what the frequency is of this resonance. The resonance, because <coughs> at the resonance, the reflected and the input sound uh, cooperate. So they get a loud sound without more um, effort. And there, I said also that there are several resonances in, in a tube like this, and uh, you could see four of them there. Yeah. <coughs> uh, so that was the side uh, gliding sine wave. This was the experiment. I had the uh, sine wave in the earphone in the end of the tube, and it was gliding from low to high to high frequencies, and then you get some something like that. Okay. So this is uh, really the story of how uh, the uh, the vowel spectrum is bought. It is we, we put it, the input is a, a spectrum of the glottal airflow like this, like you saw before, and then it travels through a vocal tract that has a response curve like this, and then you get the spectrum like this. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, we could do this with more uh, brute force um, and because I have here a pulsating airflow, uh, it is a duck call uh, and uh, uh, it is a, a duct that is covered by a membrane that starts to vibrate in the airflow. I get a, a sound of a vibrating, uh, of a pulsating airflow. And now I could put that through the <coughs> through the resonator, and you would don't get. Well, we could look at the spectrum of the. Uh, uh, why do we have the spectrum? Is that the spectrum? Uh, this is the spectrum. So how does the spectrum look? It looks like. Uh, <coughs> There is not very much of valleys and, and uh, uh, peaks there, and it doesn't sound like a vowel sound. But if I put it through the, uh, the tube, uh, uh, it's uh, everybody's saying that. And actually, when we don't know really what we are, should say, we say, uh, and then that is then what we get with the cylindrical vocal tract. Um, yeah, um, so that is uh, a demonstration of uh, of the generation of of uh, um, 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 vowel sounds. Uh, the result when a pulsating airflow goes through a tube is a vowel-like vowel sound. Uh, now, uh, vocal tract resonances uh, are, um, we are, are controlled by the shape of the vocal tract. And uh, we could look at this. So it is evident that the, we, we form the vocal tract differently for different vowels and that is then actually tuning the formant frequencies, the resonant frequencies of the vocal tract to different frequencies. So uh, we could um, illustrate that by returning to 
the uh, um, this is it um, to the tube and uh, because I brought also a soft tube that I could pinch in different uh, places and excite with the um, pulsating airflow. <laughs> and uh, or a shift between a pharyngeal uh, constriction and an oral constriction which we say sometimes okay so you could get uh, all kinds of vowels by uh, shifting the shape of the vocal tract uh, even if you don't know how to do it. At four months number one and two, they determine the vowel, and uh, um, we could uh, sh uh, then uh, look at the um, description of that system. Here we have the second resonance frequencies of the vocal tract, second formant, and here we have the first. So we could say that uh, a, a combination of two, of two formant frequencies can be uh, um, described, specified by a point or an area <coughs> in this plot. Uh, and uh, the truth is that if we have the first f resonance at 700 hertz and the second around 16, 1700 hertz, we get the vowel A. Uh, and uh, if we combine 300 hertz in first formant with uh, 700 hertz in second formant, we get the vowel U. And if we combine uh, the same first formant with a higher f second formant at 2500 or something, we get E, and um, um, so on. Um, so uh, we could um, ask Mad to um, demonstrate that. So then I would like to have Mad and the uh, synthesizer, and then I should feed the synthesizer into the analyzer like this and we should take away the phantom power mm -hmm. so what do I have here I could go to settings and show a map like this like we just had um, where I could specify the uh, combination of first and second resonance okay uh, something like this <coughs> and we could look at the sound at the same time and ask Madde to... Uh, ah. Yeah. Um, so now I could try the 300 and 700. So uh, what I now did was just to travel around um, between the combinations in uh, this um, vowel chart <coughs> with the first resonance frequencies and the versus the second four resonance frequency of the vocal tract. Now, uh, finally, I would like to um <coughs> demonstrate a more uh, realistic uh, or artistic a demonstration and again the same story um, uh, so um, we would like to have that one and then also the synthesizer and then um, I would like to um, call your attention to the fact what happens when I when two formants come together come close together so um, let me do that um, uh, this is the second formant and this is the first formant. I will now uh, bring them further apart and closer together. And you could note 
uh, shut up, uh, you could note that the level of the peak in the spectrum increases as the formant comes closer and they decrease as they get further apart. Uh, so it uh, occurs to me that uh, Resonances are somewhat like anonymous alcoholics. They gain strength by coming close together. And um, an artistic demonstration of this is <coughs> um, the Hefele video. And uh, do I? Yeah, I think I have it somewhere. <coughs> uh, she is an overtone singer. <coughs> and uh, she is. Uh, able to uh, to uh, sing um, to play melodies on uh, uh, on the uh, on overtones in um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, a very remarkable uh, um, a very remarkable lady girl um, um, who is um, um, earning her livelihood by singing <coughs> uh, overtones. <laughs> She uh, plays a melody on overtones of a, a drone that is she is producing by putting the second and third formant on specific partials. And it sounds very funny. And that is the end of my talk. <laughs>